Welcome to The Subplot with Jesse Shapiro, where I sit down with people who aren't just talking, but actually making their dreams a reality in show business. My guest today gave me my first internship in entertainment when he was a lowly assistant at a management company. He's gone on to produce amazing comedy specials such as South by Southwest Comedy for Showtime, Michael Che's special for Netflix, the list goes on. This is the subplot with my guest, Matt Schuler. Hi everyone, thanks for tuning in to another episode of The Subplot. My throat might sound a little bit smoky today, uh, a little bit worn. I'm in the midst of a 16 day run straight of doing warm up every day, no days off, which has been great. Uh, it's always nice to have tons of work. Uh, it hasn't always been that way, so <laughs> it's nice when it when it's happening. I picked up a new show called The World's Best, which is kind of a, a new America's Got Talent, but it's a worldwide global talent competition and uh, James Corden's hosting it, uh, RuPaul, uh, Drew Barrymore, and uh, and Faith Hill are the judges along with 50 global judges. It's a new cool crazy show which is, uh, which is fun to do. Um, but my throat is definitely feeling it and it doesn't help that it is playoff season right now for baseball and the Dodgers are in the midst of it. I went to the Dodger game last night. I got off of the late show at 6.30. The game started at 6.10 and I jetted over to Dodger Stadium as quickly as possible. Went right, headed right down Beverly. By the way, if you're trying to get from Mid-City to downtown and don't want to deal with uh, freeways, Beverly is definitely the way to go. That's from straight 30 years of Los Angeles experience growing up here. Beverly's the street. You might, you could mess with third, potentially, if you're going right downtown, but if you're going into Echo Park or Silver Lake, you definitely want to mess with Beverly. Uh, so, headed right down Beverly, got to Dodger Stadium, well, swooped by El Compadre on Sunset, picked up my cousin, rolled into Dodger Stadium, and we got there by the bottom of the third inning, and we were able to pick up cheap seats on StubHub, um, which is the way to do it. Uh, the way I normally do Dodger games is I go early and I kick it at El Compadre or the shortstop, which is right outside of Dodger Stadium, and I just watch StubHub or Vivid Seats or one of the other uh, you know, seating ticket apps and watch as prices drop as it gets closer and closer to game time. Usually I want to be in there before the game starts, so I'll pull the trigger at some time you know, 20 to 30 minutes before the game. But in certain cases, I've waited till after the game and waited till drop, uh, tickets drop even further. So if you're trying to get a good deal on Dodger tickets, that's the way to do it. Just hang out outside the stadium, wait till you find some seats that you like at the price that you like, and then walk in. Uh, and I do highly recommend walking into Dodger Stadium because uh, the parking lot is always a cluster and getting out of there is a nightmare. So if you walk in, you just walk right out. I usually park on Sunset. There's some hilly areas you know, across in between the 101 freeway and Sunset, which you can normally find street parking, which I do as well. Uh, so that's that's how I do Dodger games. And it's, Dodger Stadium is a special place. Last night uh, was the 13 inning game. We have another game starting in around an hour. By the time this is published, you, by the time you're listening to this, you'll already know the fate of the Dodgers in the 2018 season, or you won't because you don't care about baseball, which is totally fine too. Um, and so you've probably already fast forwarded this part to get to the interview. <laughs> but uh, yeah, Dodgers, uh, Dodger baseball, it was an exciting 13 uh, inning game last night and uh, we won it in the bottom of the 13th inning and I was there screaming my face off, which might not have been the best idea. Uh, I was asked recently, Someone had seen my movie and hit me up an email and said that how much they liked it because uh, it's kind of my love letter to Los Angeles. Nobody walks in LA. Free on Amazon with Amazon Prime if you haven't watched it yet. Check it out. Uh, but they said, what's your favorite place in LA? And I thought about it for around six to seven seconds. And then I said, 
Dodger Stadium, <laughs> which is not featured in my movie for obvious reasons. I did a low-budget indie movie. We weren't going to be able to get into Dodger Stadium, and I didn't feel like getting arrested to try and steal that scene. <laughs> so, uh, but Dodger Stadium is just a special place, and I think the reason I was thinking about it last night, I think the reason I like it so much is just it literally is everyone, all types of folks that are living in Los Angeles coming together to celebrate one thing, and that's baseball and the Dodgers and sports. And so you have people from all walks of life. You have the Hollywood superstars, and, and you've got everyone, you know, people working minimum wage jobs, and but they all come together and love the Dodgers together and get all hyped up together. And so it's really a sense of community and a place where Los Angeles can really come together and have some beers and have a good time. Uh, I think there's not an, a lot of other places like that in LA. I think maybe the Hollywood Bowl, uh, potentially the Hollywood Bowl, but usually at the Hollywood Bowl, you're still kind of going to see a show, which is gonna make you go to a show. You're gonna be going to a show uh, of a band or of a person, and a lot of the people that are there are probably gonna look like you. <laughs> if you go to a classical show, <laughs> There's gonna, you've got the classical musical audience. If you've got a Florence and the Machine show, you've got the Florence and the Machine fans, and so on and so forth. And so, um, while the Hollywood Bowl is an incredibly special place, I think Dodger Stadium is great because it's just you just get to interact with all different types of folks, all different walks of life, and uh, that is something that's very special and doesn't always happen in Los Angeles. So that's why I love it, and I also love the Dodgers. I also grew up here, so. The Dodgers mean a lot to me. And I went to game two of the 1988 World Series where Oral Hershiser pitched a complete game. And so Dodger Stadium kind of feels like home to me. And it's, it's something I've been doing since childhood. It's something I, I went to games with my grandfather when he was alive. And so there's definitely a nostalgic uh, just love there that I have for that place and for the, for the team. And, you know, there are other sports teams in Los Angeles, but... The Lakers, a huge Lakers fan, but that doesn't happen uh, at the Staples Center, that kind of feeling, because the tickets are so expensive, and so you can only go if you've got a good amount of dough. Uh, we haven't had a football team in forever. Maybe that'll happen at Rams games. I don't know how expensive seats are to Rams, but, uh, to Rams games, but again, a lot of the people that have been in Los Angeles for a while aren't Rams fans. We have some people that were Rams fans, but I grew up a Raiders fan because the Raiders were here when I was growing up. And I haven't hopped on to the Rams bandwagon yet, even though they're 6-0. and And I probably won't, because I'm fiercely loyal to my teams for some reason. I don't, I don't hop around on teams. I'm not one of those people who just puts on a new hat because they start winning. And, and I like to make fun of people who do do that. Uh, I think unless you're coming from another country and you're totally new to a sport, or and I understand if you didn't really care about sports growing up and then maybe you get into it later in life, I can I can float with that, but I think if you've grown up watching a sports team and then you just abandon that sports team, for some reason, it, it bothers me on a fundamental level. And I, maybe I need to do some introspection and think about why, but <laughs> anyway, moving on. Uh, my guest today is Matt Schuller. He's someone, he's one of the first people I met in show business and he's just salt of the earth guy, uh, as you can tell. Uh, as you will tell by listening to his interview, he's brutally honest and completely uh, self-aware in terms of what his strengths, his weaknesses are, what he likes, what he doesn't like. Uh, and so he gave me my first job in entertainment at a management company. He was an assistant there. He went on to become a very successful manager, uh, managing great comedians um, that are still doing incredibly well, like Burt Kreischer and Steve Byrne. Uh, uh, but at a certain point, he wasn't digging management anymore, and so he transitioned into straight producing, to producing comedy specials and documentaries, and he's doing uh, some great, great, great stuff now. Uh, and he's always just been fearless in that sense of not really caring or not feeling an obligation to be something or to do something if he's not happy or not enjoying uh, the path that he's on. And he's he pivots and he adjusts and he goes and does other things. Uh, and I think that's something I really respect. It's, it's something that I don't think a ton of people do in this business. And so I wanted to sit down and talk with him. I also think this is a great episode as a primer for someone 
interested in getting into show business, but not necessarily knowing what route they might want to take. Uh, I think because Matt started off in an agency, he went and worked at a production company, he then went and worked at a management company, he's now producing. He's worn a lot of different hats in this industry and speaks very intelligently and uh, helpfully uh, for folks who are just kind of trying to figure it out. So without further ado, here is my episode with Matt Schuler. I'm here today with my old school friend, the person who gave me my start in the industry, hired me at, as, as, an, as an intern at Power Entertainment, um, which it's you know, if, if, you're, if you're called Power Entertainment, it probably means you don't have a lot of it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we can cut that later. Uh, anyway, I'm here with my buddy Matt Schuler. Um, I've known Matt for over... 12 or 13 years now. Holy shit. 14. 14 years. Yeah. Um, and I'm really excited to talk to Matt today for a number of reasons, but one of the primary reasons um, is because Matt, uh, he's run the gamut. He started off working at an agency, then he was a manager um, for, for big stand-up comedians, and now he's an independent producer. He stopped off at, at worked for Audible and Amazon along the way. Um, and so... He's worn a lot of different hats in this industry, and something that I've always loved and respected about Matt is that um, he's willing to take risks and to um, to realize that, hey, something's not working for him or he's not liking something, and so then he goes and he makes a change, and he shifts that. Um, so he's got balls. He's got cojones. Uh, and uh, so thank you for coming, Matt, or thank you for showing up in your living room. <laughs> Thanks for having me, and uh, I, I appreciate the intro. Yeah. yeah. Um, oh, and uh, so, like, yeah, some of the stuff that he's, like, some of this, uh, the comedy specials that he's produced, he just produced the Michael Che um, Netflix special. He's produced, he was he managed and produced a bunch of Steve Burns comedy specials. He's done um, the South by Southwest uh, comedy special. What, what's that show actually called? Yeah, it's South by Southwest comedy, comedy series for Showtime. For was, Showtime. Yeah, we did four episodes. Right. So, um, he's... He's all up in stand-up, and now he's branching out into documentaries and developing a bunch of other cool ideas, which he may or may not be able to talk about. We'll see. Um, but I kind of wanted to start at the beginning, Matt, because like, and this is kind of the fun part too about getting to talk with my fr with your friends about this. Is like I don't really, I don't think I know your origin story. <laughs> like, I know that you were you grew up like outside of Boston, but like, did you, did you know from a young age you wanted to be in entertainment? Like, when did you start thinking about getting involved in entertainment? Yeah, I was a Saturday Night Live uh, super fan, and I would stay up and watch that. In like junior high or high school? or As early as like, I think 10 years old. Okay. Um, I would stay up uh, even when I wasn't supposed to and, and watch that, because you know, back when you had to like actually stay up and watch it. Right. Uh, <laughs> it wasn't just available yeah. for streaming. You, 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 you didn't just get to watch the four good sketches uh, the, next, the next Monday. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. So, and I loved, um, you know, comedy movies. I loved Caddyshack and those kind of things. And uh, so I was kind of obsessed with it. And then me and my friends... Uh, as early as I think eighth grade, my friends and I started shooting and like making sketches. I didn't know that. Yeah. Just like we, uh, like my dad had a camera that I could use and my dad had like had an editing machine, which is like a, uh, that, uh, that's a, a longer, a much longer story, but my dad invented digital editing. What? Yeah. Um, <laughs> I didn't know that. Yeah. So the, the Avid <laughs> is based on my dad's patent. So my dad invented the montage picture processor which licensed the patent to Avid for years. And my dad won a Technical Academy Award in 1987. Who would have, so, I had no idea about any of this I don't, shit. I actually don't tell, I don't tell like people because it sounds like bragging, but I mean, in this kind of interview setting, like it's cool, but I just don't like, I don't want to, you know, I'm not like at lunch, like my dad did this. You know, not, you don't just have the Oscar like on a chain that you can just wear around your neck and roll yeah, around. Exactly. Um, oh. but, but that was like my first taste of the entertainment industry was I was uh, I was like eight or nine years old and my parents uh, took me out here for the Technical Academy Award ceremony oh wow and so we stayed in the Beverly Hilton yeah and like um, I had to get a babysitter I couldn't like they got a babysitter for me I couldn't go to the award show right um, but like I had a $600,000 editing machine in my basement when I was a kid holy shit yeah they, they were like the size of an arcade back then wow um, like an old school Pac-Man arcade and I would shoot stuff and I would edit on it and like, um, 
you know, like Stanley Kubrick used the montage picture processor for Full Metal Jacket. So my, tell, like, I mean, as a filmmaker, now I'm fascinated. Yeah. Like, it looked like a Pac-Man machine. It was like that big. It was that size. It didn't okay. look like it. It had weird dials on it, and like, okay. so basically, what it was, what it was, is the technology was so primitive back then. We're talking late '80s, right. mid '80s, right. when when he first invented it. Um, it was they would take the film and they would just screen the dailies into the computer. Right. And then they you could edit it and it would keep track of the frame numbers where you edited it. Okay. And then later you could go back and use that to cut the film later. Got it. So it's not like now where you put everything Ringing in digitally in. and it's all it you never have to worry but about. But basically that it allowed you to kind of see what the picture would look like mm -hmm. and then you went back and did the actual physical editing of the cutting and slicing and all that jazz. That was like the first generation. Got and it. I didn't I just like messed around on that a little bit and right. I didn't do that I wasn't doing sketches with my friends yet right. and then by the time I started doing sketches with my friends I was like 13 years old so I was it was like 1990 like two ish um, and so the technology had improved a lot from the late 80s, 80s. till 92 so I could actually shoot on like a super 8 or, or something like that and then I could like um, put it into the machine and edit it like uh so we would do like Star Wars spoofs and Back to the Future spoofs and like Top Gun spoofs. I know you you're famous for a Top Gun spoof. <laughs> uh, mine wasn't I wouldn't as, say famous, but <laughs> mine wasn't as good as yours. Uh, but uh, but yeah, we like we were just a bunch of like you know kids. I did it all through high school. That's so awesome. I did it eighth grade, ninth grade, tenth grade, eleventh grade. Was your dad working for a company, or like what was his inspiration? How did he get it? Like, so my dad my my dad started this company with a, with a partner. Um, and they uh, co-invented the montage picture processor, and the uh, they had all that success. But then, like at, shortly after the Academy Award, uh -huh. they the company went uh, bankrupt uh -huh. and had to be sold at auction. And uh, a rich real estate developer bought the company and kept my dad on as like a, you know a senior executive. Right. And um, and basically, the company eventually shifted from actually making machines. Because that wasn't like their strong suit right. to just like, uh, you know, patent law and like basically like it wasn't just Avid. Avid did license the patent, but right. like it was also like it ended up being like Sony, Panasonic, like Everyone. a lot of different, a lot of big media, a lot of big technology companies even used just pieces of it in their right. equipment. And they had so, to pay them up. Yeah. The patent then. Because they would even put like little bits of it in like the original like DVR, like TiVos and right. like. And like uh, in VCRs, even some like high tech VCRs used components of the technology. Right. So there was just tons of applications that were being licensed, and so he was mostly just like spending his days in court, like you Got know, it. after that. But anyway, it was like, you know. But my dad did get to talk to Stanley Kubrick on the phone. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, my dad got to talk to Sidney Lumet on the phone, who who used his machine and stuff like that. Wow. So, um, so that was like, and I grew up in Massachusetts, so the right. entertainment industry wasn't a thing. Right. No, nobody else had parents that were like doing that. Yeah. And before that, my dad had just been like an inventor who did stuff for like the Department of Defense and stuff like, right. you know, just inventions that were used by the Department of Defense or the space program. So it's like, this was like a real departure for him too. Awesome. That's um, so cool. Wow. See, I, you learned something new. I'm glad I learned that today. That's exciting. Yeah. So you were making all these sketches and and it, it was always comedy from the very beginning. It wasn't yeah. like you're like I'm a drama. We never did drama stuff. Yeah, it was always right. ridiculous. Like yeah. <laughs> like like when I I still have the VHS. Uh huh. Uh, I still have the VHSs from back then, and it was right. like it's it's really silly. I think it would it's only funny to me and the other guys that were doing it. I'm sure if I watched it, I'd laugh my ass off. Maybe, but only because <laughs> you know me. <laughs> so. So then, at a certain point, you're in high school, you're doing these sketches, had you ever thought, like, did it become real to you when you came out here, that, like, hey, there are people that get paid money to do this, like, or did, did that come later? It came later. I was, uh, I just really never, even though I had that, like, little taste of the entertainment business through my dad, I really never thought that this was real. Right. I didn't think that Hollywood, L.A., like the entertainment business. I didn't think it was something that I could do. It almost seemed like those are immortals right. like doing like 
amazing stuff that like I could never be a part of that. Right. So I and it was just like a total assumption. Like yeah. And I was an ambitious kid. Right. But I still just didn't think that that was something I could do. Right. Um. I went to just Purdue University in Indiana. I got a traditional like undergraduate business degree. Uh Um. And uh. And then when I was done with college. Uh, well, in my senior year, I was going to these job fairs that all my friends were going to right? <clears throat> and like interviewing with like companies like Procter and Gamble and stuff. Right. And I really was like, if I have to, I can't do it. <laughs> like, I, <laughs> yeah. I feel like this is, yeah. this will be a theme in our conversation at certain <laughs> points in Matt's life. He's just like, no, nah, I can't do this. I can't do this anymore. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So I, I, I read a book called like. I don't know. It was called something like Hollywood 101. Uh-huh. Um, I don't know. Maybe I can tell it to you later if you want to like, you know, insert it later. And I'm sure there are was... tons of books out there. Hollywood 101. Yeah. Amazon. It. I wish I knew the title <laughs> though. And at, at the end of this book, it said that if you want to be on the non-creative side of the entertainment business, like, yeah. uh, you know, an executive or producer or whatever, right. it's best to start at, at an agency. Right. It's like the grad school for the entertainment business. Right. And it had the... You know, this is back in like 2001, and right. it had the addresses, uh, the physical addresses of all the major agencies with like, uh, you know, it said, you just write your letter to like Attention Human Resources and send right. it here. And like, I did that. I like sent, like, I mailed my resume <laughs> with a postage stamp to all the major agencies. I, I, I there, there were only four at uh-huh. the time that I sent, I, CAA, William Morris. UTA and uh, ICM. and ICM and I didn't even think like none of the other ones like Paradigm and, and APA and Gersh existed but they just weren't on my radar and right. never existed and they weren't in the book yeah <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah so I just so I sent my resume to all of them and then um, uh, I got callbacks from UTA and ICM and I went in for interviews with both of those places and uh, and then well, wait so you got from a straight letter you got I mean, because I can only imagine how many, because eventually you work in the mailroom, mm-hmm. but I can only imagine how many people are writing letters saying that they want to work at the agency. Like, yeah. why do you think your letter stood out or why, like, because two out of four is a pretty great ratio. I mean, yeah, I, I mean, I have a theory about it. Like, first of all, I asked my dad if he had any connections to help me yeah. and, and he said no. Right. I mean, he was like, he was trying to brainstorm, but he really didn't like he didn't have any way in to help me. Right. So I had no help. Um, I Later, I kind of found out that they did like Midwestern kids from like big schools because um, they like, w- I think m- nice Midwestern kids calm down those crazy agents a little bit, <laughs> maybe. I think there was a lot of us at UTA. There was a, like a lot of kids from University of Michigan, my wife right. uh, included. There was a, a partner from University of Michigan, but like the HR per- person just for some reason liked Midwestern like kids. And and uh, there were also like a, you know, a good mix of the UCLA and USC kids there. Right. But uh, uh, I, that might've been some part of it. I also, I also think that it was slightly less competitive then than it is now, now. Yeah. because uh, the my generation of kids born in the late seventies is smaller. Right. Um. So it might have. I. I don't know. I. I also. And this was before Entourage, and everyone wanted to become the next Ari. So. Yeah, <laughs> that's true. And also, the, it was such a high turnover. Um. They've cleaned it up a lot. Uh. Agencies are much nicer places to work now. Right. They've They've come up with a lot of like a lot of partners at the big agencies have have chastised the other agents for being so mean to their assistants. Right. So that's kind of like, it hasn't totally gone away, but it's gotten much better. When I was there, it was just like full on, like if you wanted to have a temper tantrum and scream at your assistant and call them like horrible names, it was completely acceptable. Right. Nobody had a, you, if somebody called me like the worst names, as long as they didn't get like, racial you know right. as long as they didn't call me the k-word or something yeah. like yeah. like it could be whatever they wanted like right so uh a lot of people quit too right so that's one of the reasons i think i got in too is because there's so turnover was so high got it i mean uh, of the people i started with like i think a third didn't even make it through the first month wow or maybe the first two months wow yeah that's huge turnover yeah um and so you write this letter you, you send your resume, you get called back 
Did you get a phone call, or how do you find out? Did they write you a letter back? No, they they they, they called me. Um, and so then, it, I'm sorry, it was UTA and who? Which was UTA and ICM? Okay. They called me. I went in for a first interview just with the HR person over my spring break. So I came out here spring so break. So you you flew all the way out here. And, yeah. And, and was it you were you able to set up both interviews on yeah. in, that, in that week? Mm-hmm. And so how was it, was that like really exciting for you as a young buck? It was out? like. Uh, you know, I still didn't know if that was what I was going to do. Do I mean, right. I, I, w- I wanted to do it, but right. like, um, I just met with the HR people. I didn't meet with agents and the HR people, like, you don't realize it then, but they're like the least powerful pe- people <laughs> in, the, in the agency. Right. They're the nice ones. Right? Yeah. <laughs> so, and, and I was, I wanted like a, a job before I moved out here. Like right. I wanted to know I had a job and neither one of them were willing to do it. They were just like, I think they just think that so many kids are flaky right so they're they just don't believe you're going to move out until you tell them you're going to move out so they were like yeah both of them said yeah if you move out here give us a call and we'll bring you back in for a second interview (laughs) so it's like a catch-22 where you're like well i'm not going to move out here unless yeah (laughs) unless i know i have a gig yeah (laughs) right but uh so i just decided to do it and uh um i so i i drove out here after like right after i graduated and I, i called them both and set up second interviews. Uh, ICM didn't call me back. UTA called me back and set it up, and I went in. And then ICM called, ended up calling me back after I got the job offer at UTA, UTA. which I accepted. But they, uh, UTA just offered me like, uh, I mean, in, in, in the short version of it is, uh, I went in for another interview, and then they had me come in for a, a, a another interview after my initial interview, like a, like a day later. Yeah. And the, the, the second interview was with Sue Nagel who ended up eventually running HBO yeah. for a little while. And Jay Suris, who is the managing partner of UTA yeah. now. Right. But this is back in 2001 and they were right. both, um, I think they were both partners, but like they Junior weren't, partner, yeah. yeah. Well, I, they were both, I think senior partners, but okay. they weren't like, uh, they weren't like, the ballers that they are now. Right. You know? um, but it was kind of intimidating. I remember uh, Sue was sitting behind her desk and I was like in the guest chair facing her. And then Jay was like on the couch next to me, like looking at my side. Mm-hmm. And she was asking me like really straightforward, like, like interview questions. Like, right. like tell me about your experience in college and how you think that'll translate. Right. And, and he, Jay was asking me like ridiculous questions. <laughs> And I was like, <laughs> like what? What he was like, what kind of drugs have you done? <laughs> and I, I think he was trying to get me to laugh. Um, <laughs> and uh, but what, what I, kind of drugs had he done? <laughs> I'm just kidding. Well, I answered it honestly. <laughs> um, just like got some weed and yeah, uh, <laughs> I was like, I've done weed and mushrooms. Uh, <laughs> and. Uh, <laughs> And like uh, I'm just picturing little like 23 year old Matt being like weed and mushrooms. <laughs> yeah, 22 year old Matt. Yeah, it was, but it was. I was like, I was too nervous to laugh, but I was also just like, I bet he just wants the truth, right? You know? Yeah, yeah. Um. So uh, and then they had me. They were like, honesty you... is always the best policy. Yeah. Well, sometimes. Yeah. Maybe not all the time. If but... you're a heroin addict, you might not want to share that. <laughs> Um, so they had me wait outside, like they were like, wait outside the office. So I go outside and the assistant's like, okay, let me walk you back to the reception to get your parking validated. And I was like, oh, they actually asked me to like, wait right here. And he's like, really? And he goes in and and he comes back out. He's like, you're right. And, uh, and then like he went, they called him back in like a minute later and I'm just standing there like confused. And he comes back in and he's like, okay, you can start Monday. Just go report to the mailroom guy. And so it was like really cool. That's awesome. Yeah. And so, you know, the at a certain point though, you were like when you came out over spring break, you weren't sure whether you wanted to come out and then you finally just decided, "Hey, I'm going to go for it." Was there anything that influenced that or was it was there an aha moment that you had where you, like did you have any friends? Did you know anyone out here? Were you just like, I mean, my uncle was out here, okay. um, but I didn't I didn't stay with him. I didn't crash on his couch. I hung out with him every once in a while. Right. Um, but uh but I didn't rely on that. Like I, I came out here with four friends who ended up flying back, and then uh, and I just got a cheap apartment and like you know went for it and just went for it. And I just figured I in in the back of my mind, I did think, oh well, if this doesn't work out after like six months or a year, I'll just move back home. Right. 
So that you were just like, but I should just give it a shot. You're like, I don't want to work at Procter and Gamble. This is exciting. Yeah, yeah. And I was like, I could at least probably get a job like waiting tables or something. Which right. I didn't realize that that would have been totally impossible because that's like the hardest <laughs> job to get out here. Right. <laughs> um, but I thought I was like, well, I've waited tables before. I could right. probably do that out there if I had to. Right. Um, I ended up just getting that job at UTA really quick. So. And another question I had is like, before when you were in high school, you were you were thinking more. You, you, you were doing creative stuff in terms of, you know, writing and, and the sketches. And then after business school, you were like, when you had read the book, you were like, oh, if I don't, if you don't want to be on the creative side, then you go the agency route. Was there, a re, uh, was it something happened that you were just like, I'd rather be on the business side than the creative side or? I, I don't know if it's like, uh, I just thought, you know, like I, I heard this interview with, with Geffen once and yeah. he, and they were like, he, he went and met with like somebody who ended up being a mentor and they were like, do you have any talent? And Geffen was like, no. And, <laughs> and then they were like, well, you should go be an agent. And yeah. like, and, and I remember thinking about that to myself. Like, yeah. like I, I, I don't like, I never thought that I would be make it as like a creative type. So, but I was, I knew I could work harder than everybody else. Right. So I was like, well, I'll just, I think I could maybe be a successful producer or agent or executive right. or something. So I just like dove into that cause I just had no confidence and like, you know, I knew, I didn't know that much about the entertainment business, but I was a Saturday, Saturday night live fanatic. And I knew that all those writers went to Harvard and, right. and I, I was like, and, and they all had creative writing backgrounds and, I just knew I couldn't compete with that, and so uh, I knew that my path was going to be on this side, yeah. Right. But, I mean, uh, producing is a very creative endeavor as well, so, I mean, I, and I think Matt is, uh, like, one of the funniest people to hang out with, and just one of the funniest people in general, so Thanks. I think I think you, you've you proven yourself in creative endeavors as well. Um, do So you make it out here, you're, you're now an agent trainee at UTA, tell me a little bit about that experience, I mean, like... Obviously, we, we don't need to throw anyone under the bus here unless you want to, but... Uh, yeah, no, I, I, you know... Uh, sounds like you got screamed at a lot. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, uh, but I don't have any resentment towards anybody over there. Right. Uh, it, uh, it's, you know, I think to me, and, and I think this applies to anybody who is thinking about getting into the, enter into the entertainment business and hasn't gotten in yet. Yeah. Uh, it was a real awakening for me in terms of work ethic right? because I had always done my homework, uh, at school. I had always, you know, gotten decent grades, not the best grades, but like I, 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 ha I thought I knew what a work ethic was right. and I didn't know. Right. Um, you know, like when you have jobs in college, internships, like nothing really prepares you for like the amount of like dedication and it takes uh to prove yourself and be better than everybody else because essentially you're competing with everybody else right you it's it it has nothing to do with you do this benchmark you will get promoted that's not it at all right it's 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 if you're one of the best of the mailroom class that you're in and if you're one of the best assistants once you get on a desk you will get promoted and it, that's kind of just how it is at any entertainment company, it's like if you are looking to get promoted as an agent, a manager, a producer, an executive, anything, it's are you better than everybody else around you at what you're doing? So um, in, in terms of that, like how do you – how are they judging – who the best is? Is it by just the amount of hours that you're putting in, or is it just also your personality and it's all the above? Or I mean, it's it's it. A personality is a big part of it, and doing the work and not messing up is a big part of it. Right. It's it. I really wasn't that great of an assistant, right. um, especially at that point when I first started at UTA. Uh, it really kicked my ass. Right. Um, you know, I was there longer uh, than a lot of the other assistants. I would I would stay later. Uh, I've always had my Achilles heel has always been that I can't wake up early. Um, <laughs> so I would get in later than everybody else. Uh, but I would stay late. Uh, and I just was behind. Uh, I wasn't like, you know, I wasn't, I wasn't getting it that fast. 
um, when I, and this is when I, this is after I got out of the mailroom when I got on a desk, like, you know, you, you, the duties that you have to do are, it sound pretty simple. Like you maintain the calendar of your boss, the calendar of all the clients that your boss has, right. you know, when, 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 uh, you know, I, I worked for, I worked in the motion picture lit department. So my boss worked on the teams that represented Curtis Hanson, Christopher Nolan before Batman. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, you know, just a bunch of really great writers and directors, Clark Johnson. Right. Um, and, uh, and so it was about, you know, keep you know, when, when appointments would come in for generals or pitch meetings or whatever for clients or for the boss, like, or for the agent that you work for, you have to basically keep track of all of that and then confirm the meetings like right before and nothing can go wrong on the scheduling front. You also have to send out submission letters. You basically do all of the administrative stuff for your boss. Like every single letter that goes out, the assistant types it, the boss checks it. And then once you develop that kind of rapport with your boss where they trust you enough, they'll just let you do that. So a submission letter would be something that if they want to put their client up for a particular job, whether it be... Yeah, a, a like these are the writing samples or directing samples. samples. Uh, so, so Matt would write a letter saying, please check out the... the well, in a much yeah. more professional as, way. As discussed and closed, closed please, please find. find. Yeah, yeah, that's it. Yeah. <laughs> please check out. That's not what you're writing. Don't, yeah. don't put that in. <laughs> check this Yo, out. Yo, check me out. <laughs> I got a great writer here. Um, so yeah, I mean, and, and again, I remember, you know, I worked as an assistant as well and then you're maintaining um, so many people's schedules where, and it's just, again, if anything falls through the cracks, if one, if someone goes to the wrong place, has the wrong address, um, you know, the time is off by 20 minutes or whatever. If someone's late, then the client calls you and says, I'm running late. And then you have to call the office. It's like on a daily basis, so many different things are flying uh, and you have to be really on your toes and, and be able to, to uh, handle a lot of pressure. Yeah. I mean, the agents can represent hundreds of people, right? It's, they're on teams. So it's not like ma management is different. It's usually just one manager having 20 clients or right. something. And an agency, they can represent hundreds of people. Like they, they represent almost everybody on the list and they usually divide it up by covering like one agent will cover this studio. Like right. if your agent's like responsible for like New Line and like Sony right. and then they're, they're going to submit all the writers and directors that they, that UTA has right. for every open writing and open directing job at those studios. So it's, it's, it's a lot and you're responsible for like, you know, doing the submissions, setting up follow-up calls, making sure that the that your boss knows what they should be doing, to-do lists and 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 yeah. phone sheets. Phone sheets, yeah, phone calls. That's yeah. the, the endless rolling calls. Yeah. That's when your 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 boss is in the car and you're calling them saying, "Hey, I have this person for this person," and then if they're not there, you dial the next one and it's keeping notes, listening in on phone calls, and that's probably yeah. where you start learning the most is by listening in to your boss's phone calls. Yeah. Yeah, it just took me forever. I, a lot of people picked it up a lot faster because. They already knew who a lot of the major players were. Maybe they had interned or maybe their dad was in the business right. or or maybe they just were more into like, I mean, I love Saturday Night Live and stuff like that, but like a lot of these kids were way more into film. Right. So they already, if you already know who all the writers and directors in town are, right. you have it's such a head start. It's like, I, I, I always make the analogy, it's like if you don't know anything about baseball, and then you have to be like that. You have to start playing fantasy baseball and do really well in it, and like right. and going from zero to sixty in like two months. It would be really hard because you have to learn all the players, all the managers, all the owners, all the ballparks. You know, and and now and that's what it's like in entertainment. You have to learn all the writers, all the directors, all the actors, all the production companies, all the other agencies, all the management companies, and like you. Ha if you don't know who is who and who is important, then like you know. If you're trying to get your boss to call back, like just whoever's on the phone sheet in whatever order, they're gonna get upset because it's like, well, you you had the president of New Line on the phone sheet, buried at the bottom, and you 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 wait you waited like two hours for me to call him back, <laughs> right. and meanwhile I'm calling back all these people that don't even matter, yeah. like so it's like every boss is going to hate you when you first start. <laughs> Because you're never going to be as good as their last assistant was right. at the end. When they, they spent all this time getting their last assistant up to speed, and then that person either gets another job or gets promoted, and then you start, and then they are frustrated because they have to train you, and it's oh, a right. complicated job. Because it, so I, it took the learning curve for me was way longer than most people, um, and uh, I got fired from my first desk. They don't the the agencies don't really fire 
anybody unless it's like egregious. Right. Um, but if you get fired from a desk, you have to go back to the mailroom and then interview for other desks. Got it. So I worked for this one agent in motion pictures for like six months. And then I got fired and then I went and worked for a TV agent for another six months. And I think I probably would have gotten fired. Uh, <laughs> if you didn't move first. Yeah, I, but I got another job and then I, and then I left. So What was... So what... So you worked at UTA for a total of a year? Yeah, I, exactly a year. And that's where I met my wife, Monica. Right. Uh, I love Monica. Yeah. Hi, Monica. I'm going to have her on the show, too. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, She's over at Comedy Central. She's yeah. been there forever. Um, what, so what were, after what you said, wait, was it a year or no? Was it longer? It was a year. Okay. Yeah. What were the main takeaways or what was, like, what did you really learn from that experience? And, and did you, after leaving there, did you want to go the agency route or were you thinking, I definitely don't want to be an agent? Uh, like, you know, kind of what were some of your takeaways and what was your thinking after a year at an agency? Well, one, I got to see just a little bit of a taste of the lifestyle that people out, successful people outside of the agencies had. So like if you're an agent, you put on a suit every day, you get to work at like 930 and then you work until about 7, 730 at night unless it's really busy and then you can work later. And then you go out to drinks probably two or three times a week or, or screenings or, or premieres or whatever. And, and it's just like, it's a, it's a real grind. And some people like that. But like, you know, just through uh, people that my bosses would talk to and uh, stuff like that, I got to learn that like, you know, producers like sleep a little bit later <laughs> back, yeah. back to you not like yeah. waking up early <laughs> they wear cooler like more casual clothes <laughs> you don't have to wear the suit yeah they, you don't have to wear the suit <laughs> they, they, they kind of kind of as long as they get their work done they can kind of do whatever they want so right. like it's they don't there's no rigid like schedule in terms of when you have to be in the office um and uh it's also that like they would work in spurts which I've always liked. Like I can work really, really hard. I can work eighteen hour days for like a, a few weeks while I'm working on something, and then and then and then it's like calm yeah. after you're done. You have like a little bit of a break in between projects, and I've always like I saw that when I I saw a glimpse of that with people that my bosses would work with back when I was at UT, and I was like, oh, that looks you know awesome. So 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 uh, so I basically w- was attracted to the lifestyle of of all the jobs that were outside of the agency world. <laughs> and that combined with the fact that I saw what I was up against and I knew I wasn't going to get promoted. Right. I mean, I, you know, the kids that were getting promoted were, uh, were the kids who were really, uh, social with their bosses and like, you know, uh, you know, just like, not like, I don't mean like, I'm not selling anybody out like they were like kiss asses or anything. That's right. not what I mean. But they were just very like, buddy buddy with them and like they liked gossip and they liked to like you know they liked to hang out at Barney's Greengrass and they liked to like wear fancy suits and they 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 like the agency lifestyle the mindset of like hey I'm a you know wrestler and and, you know I'm I'm in the scene and yeah and they like getting ahead of the game they like to if you want to get promoted in an agency like you know do all your do your job stuff first and foremost but like you know, schmooze the bosses, schmooze the other assistants that you work with at, at other companies and like, you know, try to like make your own stuff happen. Like, you know, try to bring in clients to your boss and be like, hey, uh, this young up and coming director is really awesome. You should take a look at him. And like, right. you know, like I just wasn't doing that. And and I knew even if I put all my effort into it, I wouldn't have been as good as those other kids who are just naturals at it. Right. So my path to getting promoted could have been years and never ended up happening interesting um and so obviously so after uta you got another job where did you I, I i worked at a small production company uh called sprocketdyne entertainment for a little bit which was uh rob minkoff's production company he was okay. like the co-director of the lion king and uh the Stuart little movies and he had done a couple of, like cool indies and stuff um was where, it hard to make that transfer or were you like did, uh... Oh, that was like the easiest job I ever had, <laughs> and I wasn't good at that either. But uh, but it was like compared compared to the agency world, it felt like club med. Right. Because you you can you know come in a little bit later, leave a little bit earlier. You had to read a lot, which uh, I personally dropped the ball on a lot. You yeah. Know, you're supposed to read all the scripts that come in, and yeah. there was a girl I worked with who was like 
another assistant there we shared an office and she was amazing at it like right. she was she was always on top of the reading um and i was always i was never really like i i have really good reading comprehension if i read a script once i will remember details from it like a year later but it takes me a longer time to read than most people right so like some people can knock out a feature script in like an hour yeah. And I can't, I it takes me like fucking four hours to read a feature. <laughs> it takes me a while too. I'm yeah. not great. Or maybe even longer. <laughs> yeah. um, so I'm a slow reader and that was like a big disadvantage. But that job gave me the free time. I felt like a weight lifted off me compared to the agencies. So I started going to comedy clubs a lot. And then I met Ari Shafir, Steve Renazizi, Freddie Lockhart, uh, a bunch of like, you know, really funny comedians that hung out at the comedy store that were also just starting out. And Monica and I started producing a sketch group with those guys. I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah. Back in like 2003, okay. all those guys were in a sketch group that uh, Monica and I uh, were like producers and, and like we just kind of like got them together, organized rehearsals, got them to write sketches and like we were kind of just like, you know, it goes back to me being obsessed with like Saturday Night Live. I was just oh, trying yeah. to do like a little Saturday Night Live, you know. But I think that's another really <laughs> good point too is that in this business, it's like you're gonna have your day job, and then you also you also need to have what you do on the side, or like your your side projects, uh, things that in the end are probably gonna end up being more fruitful than necessarily how, where, where, wherever you en- might end up in your actual day job. Um, yeah, you know, it's just you always have to be kind of like hustling and doing d- doing different things on the side. So that's that's really interesting. I didn't realize that. Yeah, it, it was called the Irregulators, and we uh, w- we did it for like a year, and we actually took it to um, Comedy Central stage. Oh, cool! Because Monica was an assistant at Comedy Central at the time. Got it. And so we, she went from UTA to Com- right to Comedy Central. Yeah, Got it. she she went to Com- She was at UTA for a year and a half. Got it. And then she went to Comedy Central. So when she was a, an assistant there, we had done a bunch of shows with the with the sketch group like around town. We did did three or four shows, and then uh, and then we took like the best of the best sketches. Um, and we, we took it to the Comedy Central stage, like half hour show. And, uh, you know, it was just like, I think that, that the freedom of the job, because when you work in an agency, you're exhausted every night. Right. Um, and then, and there's all this pressure to go out to like drinks with the other assistants and make friends with them. It's kind of like a little like fraternity. Club, yeah. Um, and, uh, but at this other place I was like, oh wow, like I'm not exhausted every night when I come home. Like I want to go to a ton of comedy shows and like. I was like, you know, I, I, I had the, the extra time and energy to kind of pursue what I really wanted. And right. I knew, I, I didn't know exactly what it was yet, but I knew I loved comedy. So I just started becoming friends with a lot of comics. And, and th- those relationships that I made then have helped me out, you know, to this day. Just like, you know, just making friends with comics and then, uh, you know, like uh, it, it, once you're like kind of in that, like world and you're friends with a few comics like it's easy to just connect with any comic because you can be like oh like you can walk up to any comic who you've never met before and be like oh i'm friends with x y and z and like right you know like i do this and this and then they're gonna start talking to you like you're not some random person off the streets right yeah i mean and i think so that's interesting so that you automatically knew that you wanted to dive into comedy i think the 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 relationships part is really important as well is that you know when you're involved in entertainment I think people oftentimes get short sighted and think um, about hey uh, like like they don't see that you're going to be in this business for 20 years or however long you know you might end up being in this business and it's like you're going to be have relationships with these people for a long time and so it's really important to like have good relationships with people be good to people don't pull dick moves um, because in the end, it's going to come back to uh, to bite you in the ass. Not always, but a lot of the times. Yeah. Um, that's, I mean, it, relationships are so, such a big part of it. Right. So how long were you at this company for? It? Like a year and a half. They lost their deal with Sony. Got and it. they had to let me go. Uh, I was unemployed for a little while. And I was friends with Ben Feigen, who w- worked with me at UTA. Right. And he had left to go to this management company, Partnership Entertainment. Power. Power entertainment, yeah. <laughs> and then, uh, and he was like, uh, he was interested in some of the comedians that I was working with in the sketch group. Right. So he would ask me like, "Hey, can you get me like so and so's email address or so and so's phone number, right. or, or like, uh, you know, like I was just like, I was helping him out. Like, 
I didn't necessarily, I wasn't thinking about that I wanted to work in a management company, but I was just like, I had this relationship with Ben and, and then he, uh, he told me that the assistant to the head of the company, uh, like le left and he tried, he said, you should come in and, and be an assistant here. And, uh, I, I didn't like, like, I wasn't really attracted to the management side of it, but I was like, oh, well, managers can also produce. Right. So I was like, oh, maybe this is a, a way for me to learn and maybe eventually become a producer. Um, and then I, uh, I ended up working for like a real, uh, difficult <laughs> manager. And I'm not saying anything bad about this person. It's just, he was very particular yeah. and very, like, it was the toughest boss I ever had. Yeah. He was very hard on me. And I think it, like, made, probably made me better in some ways. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> I don't know about, no, I mean, <laughs> basically better in the sense that you became a better human being from having worked with such an asshole. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> I so full disclosure I came in I was an assistant at Power Entertainment that's where Matt and I met so I know who he's talking about we won't say his name but um. yeah <laughs> but I learned a lot about comedy because right. UTA wasn't comedy specific in the department I worked in well, and and Power Entertainment was very stand up comedy specific yeah and it was great because uh, especially for someone passionate about co comedy um, well, first of all, I think it's interesting to note that the fact that you had just gone out and reached out to these different comedians and started your own sketch group kind of helped you get this other gig, right? So it's like people might say, well, why, why would you be doing that if you're, you know, you should be reading scripts for your boss? And it's like, well, that doing that, having those relationships with comedians actually helped them get, a, get this, this other gig. Um, and in terms of power entertainment, they represented great people. They represented Eugene Levy. They represented Fred Armisen, Fred Seth Armisen. Myers at the time I yeah. started. Uh, who oh, Keegan Michael Key was there? Mm -hmm. um, they had Ch Chichen Chong. Um, so yeah. I mean, I remember when I got the because uh, I sent in my resume to apply for an internship, um, and I remember when when Matt called me in for an interview, I was like really excited. I was like, "This is these are all these are this is a great comedy company." Um, and so, uh, but yeah, so so you start working at Power as an assistant, mm -hmm. and I remember at that time. You, uh, you also started like hip pocketing people too, right? So yeah, and, uh, I started getting into the like I started to realize like this the business of the stand up comedy world, and I started mm -hmm. to like like hanging out. With, I was really enjoying hanging out with stand up comedians, and I started to think like you know I could probably do this management thing. Like this seems kind of cool. Um, so I started uh, I started kind of like developing relationships with stand ups and and hip pocketing them and. Helping them. Hip pocketing is when uh, a, a manager, maybe you're not a manager yet, you're an assistant. And basically, what you do is you go, you say, Hey, to this comedian, I really love your stuff. I want to send you out on auditions. I want to try and get you some work. Um, as a hip pocket, you're not an official client of the management company. But with the hopes that if they do book some stuff and get some work and they bring in money for you and the company, then they'll become an official client. Does that yeah. you explain that well? Yeah. All right. And, uh, so yeah, I was, uh, you know, I, I, I you know, I was submitting clients for Montreal. I, I was, I, I was submitting clients for, uh, personal appearance work for, you know, touring work for auditions. Um, and, uh, you know, just like, uh, I, I, I realized really quickly that like I could be good at this. Um, it, it was, you know. It really just if if you have that type A personality where you can get a lot of stuff done, and you like stand up comedy in general, like you you know it's it, that's really all it takes. Um, so I was there for like a year, and uh, I got fired, uh, and 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 I don't really want to go into yeah, we don't the do details, but uh, but then I was unemployed for a while, and I was still like doing stuff with comedians, and, like on the side, right. and just like hanging out and having fun. But I was like engaged, and Monique and I were about to get married, and I didn't have a job, and her parents were like really like <laughs> worried about that. Um, I can see that. What is then, it? What's he doing? <laughs> uh, he's on the couch right now. <laughs> and then I, you know, I helped Jesse get the job at Power Entertainment, and then Jesse helped me get a job at what became. Levity, right? Because well, I want to go back to power for a second too, yeah. because I, because when I came in for my interview, Matt was like, Matt was Mister Serious Business too. Like you, you had a very like, 
And it was probably a lot of it had to do with working for this boss who he had who was. It was just, a, a dark cloud over. Yeah, it was, it was just a nightmare. But, yeah. <laughs> but yeah. <laughs> I remember at the end of my internship interview, I was like, because Matt was the only one who was interviewing, and this is the other thing is in terms of breaking into the business, I you know, I was twenty four. I had just come back. I lived in Boston for a year, and I was trying to get a job in the in in the business, and like. Even though I grew up in LA, my parents couldn't really help me out. They were my dad's a lawyer. They didn't know, and not an entertainment lawyer. And so, like, I didn't really have any ins anywhere. And so, I just had to start interning at different places and work for free. Um, and that's a, gr- in my opinion, that's the best way to start. It's like, you know, if you can't get a job straight out, you got to intern. You got to work for free. And ideally, you do it for companies or places of which you have a passion for. So when I got the call that uh, Power Entertainment and they represent all these great comedians, at that point I wanted to be a stand-up comedian. And so I was like, this is perfect. I'm going to meet all these managers and stuff. And then I'll, I kept it on the DL that I was doing comedy on the side until later. Tell but, me if this story is true. Yeah. I, I, I think that this happened with you. Uh, you came in and interviewed with me mm. to be an intern. And you said, is there any chance that this could turn into a, like a, a full-time job? Yeah. And I think I said either no or probably not. You and said no. Like, <laughs> <laughs> you were like, no, this will never turn into a full time job. I was like, all right, uh, well, at least you're. Thanks for being honest. <laughs> and then, like three weeks later, you were hired. Yeah, that was the best. Yeah, so I got hired three weeks later as as an assistant after being an intern. It was pretty hilarious. But um, all right, so yeah, so Power Entertainment. There was there was a lot of uh, just it was a clusterfuck at times, and so Matt ended up getting fired, or I would say leaving, uh, or just. Technically, I was fired. Yeah. Okay, um, but so so you're unemployed. Yeah, and then uh, I, I kept talking to you and Bill. Right, and I kept. So at that point, I had left. Sorry, I had left Power because the person whose desk I was on, Judy uh, Brown, then Judy Mar- Brown Marmel, now um, she left and started her own company, and so I went with her um, and another one of the partners named Robert Hartman, who is the uh, primary owner of the Improv Comedy Club chain. Um, and so, yeah, and so then, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, so, so I, I kept telling you guys, like, oh, I really wish I could work with you guys. Right. And then, uh, and, and I think that you kept, like, suggesting me, I think, uh, to, to, to Robert and Judy to bring me on. I, I don't know exactly how it went down. Right. But, uh, but then eventually they brought me on. Yeah, because they were looking for a junior manager, someone to serve as clients. And I had already made it pretty explicitly clear that, I, I was Judy's assistant at the time, but you know she, she wanted me to be a manager, and I had no interest in being a manager. I was like, "There's no way I'm doing what you're doing." And primarily, it was just because I like I've always I've always been on the I've known that I wanted to do creative stuff from the very beginning. And while I saw I thought that going the management route could lead to being producing and being creative, a lot of it is your your nurturing people's other people's careers uh, to do creative and great things and I wanted to work I wanted to be the creative <laughs> I didn't want like, I was like no that's what I want to do I I just don't have the patience uh to like to kind of nurture other folks when I have all these dreams and uh, that I that I want to accomplish so um you know uh so that's why you know I was like I don't want to be a manager um and then so we brought we brought Matt on was I still yeah? Because I yeah. was I was still assisting at that point. We right? were we were working out of Judy's house. Yeah, and, uh, <laughs> and and I mean I'm 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 proud of the fact that I was like you know that I was with you guys and that I, and that I you know I feel like at least in some small way I helped them develop levity uh, from the small like startup basically to uh, to being kind of a legit management company. Yeah, it's uh, definitely and, legit. You know, in there. And so yeah, I, mean, I I kind of went in I kind of went into management like. Because that's when I was like, I wasn't an assistant anymore. I was like a real manager for the first time in my life. And I just really dove into it like as aggressively as I could. And I, you know, I, I was working with people like Jay Larson and Steve Byrne. And, you know, over the course of this se- the seven or eight years I was a manager, uh, you know, Rachel Feinstein, Brian Callen, uh, Beth Stelling, um, just a lot of like really awesome, you know, people. Yeah. Um, and so... Uh, so so I was I was managing a, a lot of really great comedians, a lot of uh, uh, you know uh, great peop- great comedians who I'm still friends with uh, and still love and still hang out with every once in a while, um, and then um, and I was also started to produce specials, um, and I produced a couple like pilot uh, pilot presentations for Comedy Central that didn't get picked up, 
Um, one was with like Owen Benjamin's band, right? right and right, right. That's uh, another one was with Dwayne Perkins. That was like a green screen type show, right? Um, and uh, <clears throat> but I was always like loved the producing stuff way more, than and the than the actual management stuff. So I eventually, um, you know, I mean, it's a long, complicated story, but I did eventually like cease the management stuff before we get there i want to i want to ask some questions about management though so when you're managing for potential for comedians out there who are want to get signed by a manager for you know kind of and also having seen it in the agency world as well what what is the best strategy what should someone do if they want to get a manager's attention is there is there a good strategy are there things that people should do that they shouldn't do um like what's what's your feelings on on this yeah i mean look i i represented a lot of uh, mostly stand-up comedians some comedic actors who were like sketch actors who weren't stand-ups some comedic writers um and and uh you know my my advice to anybody who's a performer whether you're an actor or a comedian i think that the best thing to do is to put your nose to the grindstone Go do as many shows as you can, or do as uh, do as many like stand up shows as you can. Do as many short films as you can. Do as many like like plays as you can. Just do as much performing as you possibly can, and take classes. Like get better. Like just work on your craft as much as you can, and get out there. Like get out there so people can see you. If you're a comedian, try to get into festivals. Like uh, try to get into the Montreal Comedy Festival. Don't even, this is my advice, and this is not true if you're a writer. If you're a writer, you should try to get a manager or agent by sending your writing samples to managers and agents. But if you're a performer, don't even try to get an an agent or a manager. Don't even try. I know this is like maybe not the advice that everybody gives, but I think if you're just out there doing good shows all the time, and you're, you know, and you're doing as much as you can and you're trying to get into festivals and you're trying to like, you know, if you're trying to open for this comic and then, and then make the relationship with this club and, uh, or, or if you're, you know, you, your friend gets an audition and so you, you, you ask if you can come with them and, and see if the casting director will see you and develop a relationship with this casting director or maybe, you know, a casting director comes, sees, and sees one of your shows and invites you into audition. It's just like, if you are just doing the best you can in terms of getting your stuff out there and putting your best foot forward, then everything else in terms of representation will come. Right. The managers will find you, and it's almost like they have to think it was their idea. Right. If if you uh, are submitting yourself uh, to agents and managers, it's not that it can't work. Like uh, there's obviously been success stories of people doing that, but if. If, if you just are doing good shows, that's, that's how, uh, you know, if you ask most agents and managers like, Oh, how did you discover your favorite three clients? Like they're all almost always going to tell a story about how, Oh, I was just at this random sh- comedy show sure. and I saw this, this amazing comic or now like YouTube or whatever that yeah. might be. But I mean, I think that's really the point is you should con- always be creating like what and performing. Is it like you should constantly be working on some type of project that you're creating, that you're releasing, um, and be making stuff, um, and don't wait for permission. I mean, especially nowadays, you, you just don't wait for permission. Don't wait until you get booked on some TV show to add to your reel. Uh, write a short, or write a sketch, uh, or have your friend that's funny write a sketch, and then perform in that, mm-hmm. and produce it, and put it together. Um, I don't think... I think the, the days of um, actors and comedians just kind of solely doing their craft and waiting for the accolades to come it can happen but like it's you have a much higher chance if you're creating and putting good stuff out there um uh on the web everywhere uh, doing podcasts so on and so forth so uh people can can find out about you yeah no i i totally agree because people used to uh, when when people talk about this it frustrates me because people used to say uh it's a catch-22 if you don't have a manager or an agent then you can't get submitted for things yeah and uh, and so how am i ever going to get started um, and you can't get a manager or an agent unless you book something. So right. how do you, but like, that is not true. Like it, it, you can, if you're an, a comedic actor, you can get into UCB or, or improv Olympic, or 
you know, just put on your own sketch shows, put on your own theater productions. If you're a stand-up comic, you can you can do the coffee houses and like those entry level stand-up sets at gigs around town, bringer shows or whatever it is. And you can you can just hone your craft and do as much as possible and make short films and put them on YouTube and just do as much as you possibly can. And then and then you won't like most like most people you probably won't be that good at first but it's what makes you better at it is to keep doing it and i think another thing is you also want to find your crew you know you want you want to find your friends in this in the business as well um whether that's because you're going to come up with a group of people um in stand up or in sketch and what you'll find is like some people are going to get more successful faster than other people. But guess what? If you're friends, people will try and help each other out. You know, if, if someone gets a job writing for a certain, certain show, then when there's an opening, maybe they'll submit your packet. And so it's really important to like keep that in mind and have good relationships with people and treat people nicely. Um, and I'd like to, 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 and obviously that's not what everyone's doing in this business, but I think it's important to not be an asshole and to, to work hard and to, uh, to just be nice to people. Yeah. Um, you can you can accomplish the same things by being nice. Like right. if you're upset because you feel like an an agent or a manager or a producer is taking advantage of you, like one way to go about doing that is to go yell and scream at them and complain to everybody that you know about how much they suck. Right. Uh, but like then three years later, you're going to realize that you were maybe being naive and that that wasn't like the right thing to do and that maybe they weren't taking advantage of you. You know, and 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 then, uh, you know, if if you're just, but if you want to get out of the situation, you can get out of it in a nice way. Right. You can just say, "Hey, yeah. I think this is. I appreciate you thinking of me, and but because of this and this, I don't feel like this is a great deal for me. So I'm gonna take a step back. But I appreciate your thinking of me, and I hope hope that you think about me again in the future at some point. Yeah. Or maybe not. But I mean, like, that's the thing. And I think people think that just because you're nice, that means you get taken advantage of. And I think that that's not true as well. I think it's, you know, you can say no really nicely. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like, yeah. you don't have to be a dick when you say, nah, that's not for me. I, you know. You'll I'm, get more opportunities if you're cool and nice because right. if it's between you and another comic in an audition or in some sort of opportunity and the people who are deciding... I think you're tied, but one of you is a nice guy and one of you's not. They're always going to go with the nice guy. Right. And I think the other thing is, is this: is I think a lot of people think this happens overnight to people that success in entertainment and comedy and acting happen. You know, I've been I've been doing this for two or three years now, or I've been doing this for even five or six years now. I mean, the comedians that are that are huge right now, Louis C.K., Bill Burr, those guys have been in this game for like. 25 26 years you know like they didn't hit and become famous till their mid 40s i mean yeah. they, you know like i think you know the people need to to practice patience as well and realize like hey if you're in this you're going to be in it for the long term right if you're just trying to make a quick buck and get out of there or see hey if i'm going to devote three or four years to this or or five years and then i'm out that means you don't really want to do it that bad yeah. like for those, for those guys, for Louis C.K. and Bill Burr, it's like they didn't have another choice. They were like, look, this is what I'm doing. Whether I end up making millions of dollars or whether I end up making $40,000 a year doing the road and writing, like this is what, I'm, this is what I have to do. And so I think if, if that's what you have to do, you got to be able to take a long-term perspective on stuff and not just think that everything's going to happen overnight. Yeah, and also just don't think about it like this. Like think about it like – Am, what, would I still want to do this if I never made money off of it? Right. And I think that if the answer is yes, then you should definitely do it. Um, if, if the answer is no, if, if you would say, do you, would you be a stand-up comic if you never really made more than like twenty or $30,000 a year from it? Uh, if the answer is no, then don't do it. Because right. you have to love it and you, know, you should be prepared to like, you know, get a job. If you're like in your early 20s and you want to start any creative endeavor whether it's being an actor or a writer or a, a comedian or a filmmaker or a filmmaker you you got to you got to be you got to get a job if you need a job to survive uh, if you're not lucky enough to be a trust fund kid mm. get a job and then start doing as much towards y y your goals as possible like start doing stand up or start doing you know start making short films uh, or start writing or, or or start putting together plays and do as much of it as you possibly can and just be prepared for that to be it. Like, it, just do as much good stuff as you possibly can all the time. And then if good things end up happening, great. 
you might end up being really successful and make millions of dollars. But if your motivation for doing it is to make money, you're probably not going to succeed at it. Agreed, 100%. So at a certain point, you, you launch, you're doing managing a bunch of great comedians. And I'm interested in this because, you know, at a certain point, you were producing these specials as well for these comedians. And you decided, hey, I'm not really into being a manager anymore. I'm not really feeling this anymore. Are you? Can you talk about that kind of decision or coming to that? And which I think is like a really, an, an amazing story. And really, I give you so much kudos. I remember when you told me that you were going to be not managing anymore. Because I feel like a lot of people's, people go down a certain route and then they feel stuck in that route where it's like, I can't do anything else now. Well, this is what I am. I can't recreate myself as something different. And I think you having the courage to just to say like, hey, clients, I love you, but I'm not into this anymore. I'm going to go be a producer, I think takes a lot of courage and is, is awesome. And I give you, a lot, I have a lot of respect for you for that. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I mean, you know, I'd always been really, uh, I'd always put a very big emphasis on building up my credits when I was a manager because I thought that that would come in handy at some point in the future and I was right. So um, I, you know, instead of like some managers just kind of slap their name on a, on a special because they have the power to do that um, and they don't really, you know, put in the work to, to, to see how it all works and to, to be a part of the pr production. But I was never like that. Like I always wanted to dive into it more. And then if there were like specials that I could be working on that where I wasn't even that involved in that client's like life as a manager, but I was like maybe on the team a little bit, but I, if there was an opportunity for me to, to work on the special, like I would go ahead and do it. And then, um, so in addition to like, you know, producing specials with clients, um, I also came up with the idea for uh, what ended up becoming Red Light Comedy Live from Amsterdam. Awesome. Uh, so that was like my first foray into producing something that ended up actually being on TV that, uh, that wasn't just like with one stand-up uh, doing a special. Right. And so I pitched that idea up the ladder to the higher-ups at Levity. And they, uh, I actually pitched them like seven or eight ideas at the same time. And they thought all of them were horrible except that one. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay, so this is something else too. I think it's like really important to realize that like rejection happens all the time for everyone in this business, you know? And like you need to become very zen and at peace with people saying no. And that's okay. Um, and not take stuff personally. Um, because guess what? Most people are going to say no. Most people get rejected all the time. You know, what is it? J.K. Rowling like got rejected by like 40 publishers or something. Yeah. I mean, you need to be able to have a thick skin, skin and not think of rejection as failure. It's just someone's not into it. And that's cool. Someone else might not be. You know, it's like the closer, the more rejections you get, the closer you are to someone saying yes. So, um, you know, and I've, I've had, I've been rejected so many times. It's been, I mean, like. Oh, me too. I mean, yeah. I think being a manager, you're, you're we're protecting your clients from a certain amount of rejection. rejection. Yeah. So you're just taking it all the time. You, you get really numb to it. Yeah. Because like like uh, now I just take rejection for myself. Right. So I pitch things and I just get the rejection that I'm getting. But when I was a manager and I had 15 clients, I was pitching them. I was pitching ideas with them, pitching projects with them, and pitching them to to casting directors and yeah. and 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 you know touring people and and like getting like tons of no's and it's not it has nothing to do with the fact that they weren't awesome right but uh even like you know a young louis ck or, or insert anybody who you look up to and think is awesome they all had to deal with a ton of rejection yeah so i just felt that like wave of constant rejection as a, as a, in the representation world that's what it is yeah it's, it, if if you're only facing ninety percent rejection, that's like a good ratio. Oh, yeah, that's huge. Yeah, I mean, yeah. So we've, I mean, you've been rejected like, you've been told no thousands upon thousands of times. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's a, I probably I'm probably in the thousands now for sure. I yeah, mean. <laughs> but it's like it's it's healthy. Um, yeah. And uh, you know, if if it wasn't like that, I think there would be a lot more junk on TV and in, right. in movies. So yeah, it's like, it, it, anyway, so, uh, so yeah, I, I always, I, I always really loved working on those types of projects and, and red light comedy live from Amsterdam was like my first one where it wasn't just like a comic, you know, like, right. So, so we got to do, you know, I, I, I Russell Peters was hosting it, but Burt Kreischer, was doing like the the B roll behind the scenes stuff, so we would right. go out and do like field pieces that would be inserted as interstitials, 
And so I, I, I worked on those, like I, I kind of dove into that side of it. And so when, I mean, and obviously I have had experience producing specials as well, but maybe talk a little bit about that and how, what, maybe for someone who's just seen a bunch of comedy specials at home, but doesn't really know what the producer does or what, you know, um, how, how, how you're involved in helping to shape it. I mean, maybe speak to that a little bit. So like, obviously you, in this case with the Amsterdam show, you came up with the idea yourself. Yeah. Like what, what made you, what, did it just pop in your mind? Like comedy, Amsterdam, red light district where you, yeah. had you just visited there? Were you like, <laughs> I had gone there actually, um, when I met Seth Meyers at power entertainment, yeah. I had told them this, but I, I went there in 1997 when I was, uh, right after I graduated high school and I saw boom Chicago, which was his thing in, in Amsterdam. Amsterdam. So right. I, I saw him perform, uh, in, in Amsterdam, uh, and, uh, I loved it when I was there. Um, so I did fall in love with the city and like the culture. Um, I had never experienced such like, uh, you know, I was 18 and I grew up in Boston. I had never experienced such a liberal, cool city with like, you know, like weed everywhere, mushrooms right. everywhere. So I was just doing weed and mushrooms like the whole time <laughs> I was there and comics like, uh, doing weed and mushrooms. Right. Um, so, uh, th- what I kind of thought was like, in, in the United States, we have like Vegas. That's like our, like America's America. playground yeah. for, 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 for debauchery. Uh, yeah. And so, and Europe's and, and the UK's is Amsterdam. Like right. I, I kind of made friends with a few people that like lived and worked in London and they would like in their twenties, they would just go to, to Amsterdam for a few days with their buddies. Right. So that was like their, like. Vegas and their Vegas is way cooler than our Vegas. <laughs> <laughs> well, they don't have a fake Eiffel Tower. What are you talking about? <laughs> that's true. That's true. Um, um, so, did the um, and this this Amsterdam show was on Comedy Central, right? No, it was on. Uh, show, it was on Showtime. Okay, but the the goal of it was just to combine it with like the sensibility of like the coolest American comics that we could get and the coolest like UK and European comics that we could get. Awesome. And that's why we wanted to do it there. Just like in this like international setting in an international setting. And like, uh, I actually got in trouble with the higher ups at, um, at levity because I, was on camera smoking weed with Bert, but not like, <laughs> not as part of a sketch, but just like, and one of the like throwaway ta- like yeah. we weren't even, we, it was like before or after, like, like we were shooting something and the camera just kept rolling. Like I wasn't in any sketches, but like, but I was just like, on there was camera. just footage. There was just documentation. And, and, the, and, and one of the partners at, at the production company side saw it and was like, that that's we could get in trouble with the insurance company. We can't have one of our employees, producers, like doing something that's totally legal in this country that he's in. Um, but, uh, but he obviously never saw me at any festivals. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but yeah, so so it was uh, it was just a really great experience. I mean, you know, Hannibal Burris, Kyle Kinane, the, uh, Bert Kreischer, Christina Pazitsky, like there were some really cool comics on that show. Yeah, um, before they were like really too big to say no to something like that. Right. Um, and also who, like who, who's going yeah, to turn, who's gonna, who's turn down a free trip to Amsterdam with yeah. a bunch of comics. Like, yeah. so it was, it was like a really fun time and I loved it. And I developed a really good relationship with, um, with the Showtime guys. And, uh, and I just kind of learned a lot about like, uh, the producer. I wasn't the main producer on that, but right. I learned a lot. And yeah, to answer your question about what does a producer do? Uh, you can get a producer credit, for wearing a lot of different hats right now. I kind of do all of them in the pr- pr- stuff that I produce now, but like you can get a producer credit just for selling it and then never working on it. Right. You can get a producer credit for never selling it, but just like, but just being the guy that's like in charge of like the budget and, and who you hire and hiring the line producer and hiring the director and the DP, you can get a producer credit if you're uh, you know, a writer or a director and you have enough leverage to also get a producer credit, or if and you're if just the manager work, of the of the main piece of talent. Yeah, yeah. if you're the man, if you're the manager of the talent, it, you know you can get it slapped on if you don't want to be a part of right. it, or you can be a part of it like I used to be. Um, but uh, but there's a lot of ways you can you can you can earn that producer credit. Um, and right now with the specials and like the documentary that I'm doing now, I'm kind of wearing all those hats. Like I'm selling it. I'm uh, I'm doing the budget. I'm in charge of hiring everybody. I'm in charge of making sure everything runs smoothly and like, you know, is delivered properly. So there's a, you know, there, but there's a lot of different kinds of producers right. and the bigger the project, the more producers that you have 
kind of just like just filling one role of a producer. Right. And like the smaller the project you have, the more, the more people hats you have to wear. Yeah. So. Yeah. Um, and and I, you know, I mean, I think like part of it is that you know you were talking about the B roll, like too. That's a lot of getting creative with p- talent and, and directors and saying like, how are we gonna? What should a company besides this straight stand up? What else should we show in this special? Like for instance, I worked on Doug Stanhope No Refund special, and I just got a talent coordinator. I should have asked for producer credit, but um, the in the beginning of it, Doug goes has this rant. And we initially shot it downstairs in the basement at Gotham Comedy Club, which is where the special was shot. But it just, like, was it was weird. Because you have Stanhope, like, railing about New York City, and he wants to do comedy for miserable people, because that's where people appreciate comedy. But it was just kind of in this staid bar area, and it didn't feel, like, authentic. So I was like... I went to, Judy's, uh, to Doug's manager at the time, Judy, who was my boss, and I just said, this isn't working. And I said we should get him out on the street doing this and have him like walk down the street while he's ranting and showing like shots of dirty New York. And that's what they ended up doing. But it's kind of seeing what's working, what's not working, being able to navigate on the fly, um, you know, obviously and all the other things that Matt said as well, but it's also really envisioning like, what is it that we're trying? What's the content going to be like, what is this special about and how is it best represented visually? Who are the best people that can help, you know, make that happen. Um, and, you know, obviously it takes years and years of being in this business to have those relationships and the knowledge and, uh, to, to get that kind of stuff done. So, yeah. Um, so you were doing, so you did this, this, this amazing special for Showtime. And then like, is that when you kind of started thinking like, Hey, well, cause well, you were still being, yeah, I was still, still, I was still a manager when I, when I left for a little yeah. while. I, I think that, um, you know, I, so Matt eventually yeah. was working at Levity and eventually he parted ways to start his own management company and just do his own thing, which is another move that I really respect. Just like whenever you're not like, and, and I think something that I want to mention too about this as well. And I think it's important is like, I'm actually, I'd like, I'm, I'm curious to talk to Monique, your wife about this because like she's been at Comedy Central her whole career, you know, from being yeah. an assistant. And I often think like, I feel like if I had stayed at Levity, like, it's one of those things where sometimes in order to grow or to get people to treat you the way that you see yourself or want to be treated, you have to go away <laughs> like right. in order to kind of get get maybe the respect that, that you feel you deserve. Um, for me, it was just like I wasn't interested in, in kind of doing the stand-up stuff anymore. But I think it's like oftentimes if you start off at one place and people have seen you as an assistant or this or that, it's, it's hard for them to see you otherwise at least that was my experience yeah i mean i think that's true to to some extent it depends who you're working with and stuff like that i think with right. with, with in monica's case the company has reinvented itself so many times since she's been there right. i mean they've been in three different offices um and like they they the the president has changed a, a, a couple times since she's been there so uh you know there's really nobody there that who's been there longer that's, that's, <laughs> there, I, I mean i think there's hardly anybody there that that was there when monica was an assistant right uh, maybe a couple people but not even yeah. in, in, in her department i don't think anybody so uh so but but so that it definitely you know, depends but i but again i just feel like if sometimes it i agree with you it depends yeah. but it's yeah. It, it but yeah I, I i think that uh you know but you should definitely ask her about it i think yeah. uh you know, but yeah, so I, I, I did break off and started my own thing. And, you know, I think I was, uh, I stuck with the management thing maybe a little bit longer because, uh, of a really deep friendship that I had with Steve Byrne. Right. And, uh, and, and you obviously got him a sh- or help get, uh, help him get, get him a show on TBS or the, I mean, I don't, I think I didn't, I, I can't take any credit for that. Right. But, uh, but I, I, I definitely helped his career overall. Yeah. Um, I mean, Steve developed a relationship with Vince Vaughn who ended up being the producer and he did that completely on his own. Right. Um, and I think that, uh, you know, he deserves a lot of credit for it, but he was, he was a loyal client and I was a loyal manager to him and, and, and we, you know, we're, we're good friends and we worked well together. And that was one of the reasons I kind of stayed in the management thing maybe a little bit longer than I would have wanted. And then the other reason uh, was because I had uh, a kid and uh, I think, um, uh, yeah, I, I mean, I, I, I didn't have my, I didn't have my daughter yet, but I had my son at the time and I, you know, it's like a little bit scarier to quit something that's bringing in some steady income, income right. uh, when you have a kid. But I, 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 ultimately I was like, you know, and I think everybody should think about this at some point in their life, but do I want to be 
80 years old, looking back on my life and regret not taking a chance. And I, you know, so I was just like, I'm, I want to be a producer and I, you know, being a manager and being a producer was, was, was too difficult for me for two reasons. One, I didn't have enough energy to dive into the pr producing projects that I wanted to. Right. Because the management stuff took a lot of energy. And the second reason is, is that it was precluding me, it was preventing me from working with a lot of comics and, and comedic actors who I'm friends with who were represented by other managers because their managers didn't necessarily want them working with a manager. Right. Uh, 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 so it's like, um, not that that's always the rule, but it's definitely... In general. But it's opened up so much since I stopped being a manager. Like now... Managers love working with me, right. um, and I think maybe partially because I know what it's like to be them, and I treat them really good. Right. But also because I'm not, I, there's no conflict of interest. I don't manage any anybody anymore, so they're all comfortable having their clients work with me. Yeah. Well, that's a, and so you made those phone calls. You told your clients, and and you know you're like I'm I'm out, and they were all very supportive of you too, right? Until yeah, and I mean I'm still. Uh, I'm still friends with, uh, with all of them. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and yeah, I mean, I just, uh, with like with Steve, I did his most recent special and right. that was way after we stopped working together. Right. So, um, and, and that was a, a lovely experience and like we right. hang out and have lunch every once in a while and stuff. Um, so everybody was, uh, was, was supportive. Um, and then, uh, you know, I got a, I got a job with, um, with, with rooftop, uh, which was basically, you know, uh, a production company. They were they were a, a very established record label, but they didn't have any television credits to their name when right. I started, and they wanted to build that side of them. And this is before they had gotten acquired by by, by Audible, Audible, which is Amazon. Amazon. Um, but uh, but so I I I started working there because they had the same ambition that I did. I wanted to produce a lot of specials. They wanted to produce a lot of specials, and I had these credits, so I could help them with that. And that's exactly what I did. Um, and we produced uh, a bunch of specials uh, for for Brian Posehn, Steve Byrne, uh, Godfrey, Eric Griffin. Uh, the South by Southwest comedy thing was, um, yeah. all, was all under their banner, um, and I really liked working with those guys. They were really great, um, and uh, I still work with them on projects. On project um, I had to leave because uh, because they uh, because it's not even their fault. But because they're owned by Amazon, they couldn't do business with Netflix. Right. Because Netflix didn't want to do business with not not because they didn't want to, but because some Netflix, Silicon Valley beef. Yeah. <laughs> so Netflix didn't want to acquire specials from from from, Amazon, from them, yeah, yeah. and then also uh, they have a rule at at. At Audible, that all the specials they produce, the audio has to go into their Audible library, which makes sense. Right. And uh, and and so Comedy Central was putting all their audio content onto their series channel, so they could they stopped being able to produce for Comedy Central, oh. and they stopped being able to produce for Netflix, and so they could only produce for CISO and Showtime, and it was a little bit like you know that that's not even why I left, but then uh, I got an offer to do Michael Che's Netflix original, and. I, the first thing I did was actually try to do it with them, right? And uh, and it just wouldn't work. And then I said, "Well, can I take uh, a vacation and do it and come back, even if it's like an unpaid leave?" Right. Yeah. And they wouldn't allow that. And it's not they're, they're totally cool. It's just the corporate. It's policy. just a corporate policy. Yeah, of course. So uh, so I I um, I left and uh, ballsy again. See, that's what I'm talking about. This is like the yeah. the where you're like. But I, as a producer and someone who values your freedom and being able to work with who you want to and sell who you want to to who you want to, it's like if you can only sell to two companies, that really puts handcuffs on you in terms of being able to pursue what you're passionate about, right? Yeah. And now CISO's not buying anymore, so okay, it's yeah. really just one company. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I uh, uh, so, so I, I left and Broadway Video hired me to do Michael Chase special and that was really amazing. It was a Netflix original. And, Ma and Broadway Video is Lauren Michael's company. Yeah. So your Saturday Night Live, you know? Yeah. Uh, I, I connection. Finally, uh, I mean, I'm really, I, I never got to meet Lauren Michaels, uh, yeah. but, um, but I'm really proud of the fact that, uh, you know, I'm on the same credit page as him. Yeah, like, I, I can see that. Um, yeah. Uh, he is a, like a superhero of mine. Of course. Like that. So, uh, um, and, and Broadway was awesome to work with like yeah. like they're, they're the people I worked with the executives there are really smart and, and awesome and 
uh, you know, uh, Oz Rodriguez, who directs st- stuff for Saturday Night Live and is a really successful director outside of Saturday Night Live, also was the director, and he was great to work with. And um, it was it was an amazing experience because I, uh, you know, I had been in this zone where I'd only produced specials in like the, you know. One hundred and fifty thousand dollars and under, right? Uh, level, and this was the first one that was huge. Like, I mean, Netflix has unlimited budgets, right. basically. Um, so, uh, and it wasn't even one of their more expensive ones to them, right? But uh, to me, it was like you know, it was it was a huge, and we did it in like this old, uh, you know, a ban- a, a yeah. bus terminal like in Brooklyn, and and it was like we had to bring in our own stage and. And have the stage built from scratch, and and bring in generators and lighting and air conditioning. So it was like it was a real huge challenge, but it was amazing. Um, and it ended up, I mean, critically acclaimed. Everyone said it's beautiful, and the, obviously Che's hilarious. Like he was so. great. I mean, he you know he uh, Michael Che is so funny, yeah. and and he made you know uh, uh, all the creative choices in terms of like what you see. Uh, you know, he made those decisions with with Oz and uh, with and with Aaron. Uh, from uh, from Broadway and like you know they were like this is what this is the look we want to achieve and then you know I helped execute it right which was like a real task but he gets all the credit for like the aesthetic and making it look you know just coming up with the ideas on how he wants to look you right know, it, it, it was it, it was looked, really, it was gorgeous it was amazing yeah. it was it was a great one to work on and everybody was cool um, I'm also really proud of the way that the South by Southwest comedy one yeah ones came out. Um, and, uh, it was great working with that festival with, with South by and, um, and, and it furthered my relationship with Showtime and, uh, um, you know, so now I'm, uh, I'm doing another like sports themed, uh, comedy, stand-up comedy show for, for, uh, Showtime now that I'm going to be producing this summer. Awesome. Um, and, uh, Rob Gronkowski from the Patriots is going to host it. So I'm a Raiders so. fan. Yeah, <laughs> I'm a huge Patriots fan, so it's like no, this is gonna be the be to, yeah, this yeah. is huge for you. Um, and uh, and I'm gonna be doing uh, at least one other special for Showtime this year as well. That's to be determined. Um, and uh, um, I'm doing a documentary with Shane Moss, who's a super talented comedian. It's about psychedelics. Um, and uh, have you done psychedelics with him yet? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you you have? Oh yeah. yeah. <laughs> How can you make a documentary about psychedelics and not? do psychedelics with the person you're doing it that's with. That's awesome. Um, <laughs> I got to hear about that. We'll do We'll talk about that after the podcast. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Since this is, we're focusing on the business, not, we'll, yeah. we'll save this for our second, uh, for a psychedelic exactly. podcast. Only. Exactly. <laughs> but I, I've learned so much about psychedelics. I, we, yeah. We've been interviewing like researchers and professors from, you know, really amazing, like, like top notch institutions like Johns Hopkins and stuff. And it's, right. yeah, I'm learning a lot about the science of it and it's really interesting. And we're going to try to get that into festivals and, Right. Um, yeah. And I mean, this is like the thing that I love is, and it's, you know, is you're constantly hustling, coming up with ideas and executing them and getting them done. And like, and you know, this documentary that he's doing is they're, they're financing it themselves. I mean, like, you know, it's, everyone needs to take responsibility for, put, for putting them, for taking risks and making stuff and, and getting creative and doing it. And in the long run, if you're in this business for the long run, it will pay off. Um, if it's just, if, if you're, if you do it once and then you're like, just get a no and then you give up, you're not going to make it. Like the people who, who do well in this business just have thick skin and keep on, keep on pushing, keep on making stuff and, uh, and rocking out. Yeah. Anything I mean, else? No, man. I mean, it's, it's awesome to see you and hang out with you. And, uh, I hope, uh. I hope there's somebody watching this that's at the beginning of their career and yeah. it's helping them somehow. So. That's what I hope too. That's what that's what that's what we're doing this for. Anyway, well, thank you, buddy. Yeah, thanks, man. Um, like it, share it. If you have any more questions, if you have questions, thank you so much for listening to the subplot with Jesse Shapiro. Shout out to Richie Cunning who allowed me to use his amazing song as my theme music. Uh, you should check him out. He's an amazing indie rapper, hip hop artist from the Bay, from San Francisco. Uh, you can follow me on Facebook, on Instagram, wherever you are. I'm at Jesse Shapiro, J-E-S-S-E-S-H-A-P-I-R-O. You can also check out my movie on Amazon Prime, Nobody Walks in L.A. It is fun. It's a good time. Good. It's a good movie. It makes you feel good. Thanks so much for listening. If you are enjoying these podcasts, please go rate and review it on iTunes or wherever you listen to podcasts. I'm Jesse Shapiro. This has been The Sublot. Peace out. Have a great day. Yeah.
See, I never thought I'd get the chance to do some things I've already done. So in some ways, I've already 